listening to my podcast on the payroll. This is where I talk about all the topics I like, especially around project management, consulting, CM delivery such as Salesforce and Microsoft CE, leadership, teamwork, all those sorts of things really, really fascinate me. And basically, it's an opportunity for me to talk to my guests, people in the industry about these sorts of things and about the learnings that we learn along the way in our journey. In today's episode, actually, I talked to Kevin Boyle, who is the CEO of Gearset. What we, what really interested me was how he became from a software engineer or a developer, basically, into an entrepreneur who started a very successful company. Not everyone can do that, but he's done that really, really well. And he talks about the core team that he brought with him and how he manages to retain such a tight culture as the company grows. And I found myself learning quite a lot and I really hope that you will too. Enjoy. Hello, good morning, Kevin. Um, welcome to my podcast today on The Payroll. How are you today? I'm doing very well. It's a lovely sunny-ish morning here in Cambridge and the uh, day's off to a good start. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and I see that you started with Microsoft and that's kind of where I started as well. Okay. What I'd like to um, get into is if you can just sort of like walk us through your journey because it's a really interesting one from where you started as an intern at Microsoft to right now heading up your very own company. So I would love to hear the story. Yeah. Um, I guess my, my love of computing and, and software goes back even before, you know, my college education and internships and things. I'm from a really big family. So I've got five brothers and four sisters and my old, I'm the, uh, the second youngest in my family. So I, all my older brothers were into uh, computers and things uh, when I was growing up. So I was lucky enough to grow up in a house that had, you know, it was an Amstrad CPC. It was like a really old uh, tape based uh, computer. And so I got exposed to computing really early in my life. And then what was super about computers of that generation was, so if you wanted to play video games or do whatever it is that kids want to do with computers, you could bounce out to like a programming environment. You could bounce out to a basic prompt to do anything. So you got exposed to programming languages early. And then, yeah, I just I ignited a, a love for it. So I grew up going through school, loved computers, loved playing games, loved building PCs, got exposed to more programming. And so then it was a fairly easy choice when I went to university. This is the thing, this, you know, I would happily do this thing for free. Um, building building software and writing code and then um did that at queens in belfast that was really good fun and one of the really nice things about my university course was i think a lot of computer science courses do this but um you it was two years of taught education and then a full year internship out in industry a year of professional experience and uh, I did mine in Dublin uh, and Microsoft on the office team there is that Microsoft have a, a big European development center and a lot of localization work, a lot of like the uh, translation work. So I worked there, really enjoyed that, really enjoyed being part of the team, um, getting some industry experience. Uh, and then off the back of that, I got another internship the following year with Microsoft in Seattle. And that was working on um, again, Office Online translation stuff, but the sort of the platform that underpins it all. So when you go to office.com, all the systems that, that that's backed by, um, that was really, really good fun. So those two internships showed me, I like university, I've liked my time here, um, but I shouldn't stay in academia. I got to get out to industry. Um, so then I uh, finished up and uh, went out and, and tried try to find a job. Um, the first, the, that, that then took me to Cambridge. I was finishing my university in Belfast and uh, 
do the classic thing that grads are doing. You know, you go to all the careers fairs, uh, interviewed with a company in Belfast. And the final stage of recruitment for that company in Belfast was um, a telephone call, a, just a, a, a final screener with their head of R&D who happened to be based in Cambridge um, and did the phone call. He said, yeah, we'd like to offer you a job. Would you like to be based in Belfast or would you like to be based in Cambridge? Um, and I'd done three, four years in Belfast at that point, thought it's been an awesome city to, to be a student in. Um, but I'd like to go somewhere else now. So I'll come to Cambridge. I'll spend a couple of years in Cambridge. And 10 years later, I'm still I'm still in Cambridge. It's a it's a really nice city to to get stuck in. Um, so that's that's how I ended up here and ended up sort of that then had a knock on for all the things I've done since. So what were you doing there in your first job after um um after you finished your internship and finished your uh, degree? Yeah, I'm going to be diplomatic about this one because that was a kind of a, a love-hate relationship with that with that period of my life. Um, so I worked for a company called Autonomy Systems, um, who were acquired by HP a, a number of years ago. And Autonomy had a really interesting culture. So I was on the team <clears throat> that was building a, a system for a large British broadcasting organization. Um, and the system would ingest data sources from like all of the news feeds around the world. And then if they wanted to say, hey, what's happening uh, with the tax rise in the UK, then it would have all of the data sources ready and they could do a search for it and pull up all of the previous um, interviews that all the key stakeholders that you know the politicians had given in the past and could put together a briefing pack really quickly for, for their stakeholders. So it's a really interesting project it was loads of big data stuff before that was, you know, really a thing. And mm-hmm. it was tons of interesting challenges. And the team I was on was incredible. It was a baptism of fire. We worked um, in hindsight, things that I would never recommend anyone do. But, you know, we worked crazy long hours and we had pizza late at night in the office and um, just had an absolute crunch mentality to get this thing done. All terrible. I would never promote that as an engineering manager. This is, this is a terrible way to build software. But when I was a 21 year old grad and didn't really know what I was doing, I kind of thought this was normal and um, trusted the folks around me. And the team was incredible. So I learned so much that first year, um, but ultimately the culture of the company wasn't one for me. So I I left and I was going to leave Cambridge. I was planning to, to go. I'd found moving to Cambridge a little bit hard to adjust to because I'd come from Belfast where, um, not that I'm like a party animal, but there was like a pretty good nightlife and, you know, there was lots of nice bars and live music and things. I came to Cambridge with a certain expectation of like this massive university town. It'll be, you know, crazy uh, all night nightclubs and things. And Cambridge, if you've ever visited, uh, is not that. It's it's a lovely, sedate um, city with great restaurants, nice museums, and it's a very different style of place. Um, which I have grown to love, but at, again, at 22, I was stupid and didn't know what I was doing, and it didn't match what uh, what I what I expected. So I was, I was planning to leave Cambridge, um, and there was a local company uh, offering iPads if you interviewed with them, um, and this was before iPads. I think before they were available in the UK. Um, so all you had to do was interview with them, and you got a free iPad. And I was planning to leave Cambridge anyway, so I thought I'll take this interview and then I'll get my iPad and then be in my merry way. Um, and yeah, their the whole premise of their marketing campaign was they knew if they got folks into the building for an interview, <clears throat> lured by an iPad, that they'd love the culture so much and then love the folks they interacted with and they'd love the challenge of the the role that you know you wouldn't just take the iPad, you'd take the job if you're offered it as well. And that, that worked on me. So um I, I took my iPad and I I took the job and I stayed there for a number of years. Now, that's really where the ch- pre-gear set, that's where the biggest chunk of my career was spent um, at, at a company called Redgate in Cambridge, uh, which was was and is an amazing company, um, which I, I loved my time there. What made you leave a company that you really enjoyed to start your own company? Um, that's a great question. The I guess there's there's a, a sort of theme in my different choices in my career where Microsoft was an amazing company to work for. You had it was I was part of great teams. 
Um, I was, um, Microsoft carries a certain amount of status and kudos, and you can talk to your family about the fact that you work for Microsoft and they get that because they know who that is. Um, so working for a company of that scale uh, with that level of sort of penetration into everyday life is cool because people get it. Um, but I felt uh, the sort of classic, like it's 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 harder to make an impact at an 80,000 person company. There's, there's, it's, it's much more easy to get lost in the, the maelstrom of what's happening. And then autonomy, I moved to it. So that was why after university, I, I didn't, I took this job with autonomy, a much smaller company. They were sort of two and a half thousand people uh, at that time. I wanted to try a smaller company first. And then I thought if I didn't like that, I'll go back to the, the sort of bigger, more obvious companies. Um, so I went to the smaller um, company at autonomy, didn't love the culture love the team and really started to understand the impact that you can have on a smaller team that then sent me to red gate which was smaller again and you could have more of an impact that was one of the reasons i stayed and every 18 months or two years i would effectively change jobs within the company so i kept getting just learning new and new stuff with a smaller tighter group of people and i think that was eventually you know what really made me want to go and do gear set was we had spotted this really interesting um this really interesting opportunity, a really interesting set of people with challenge and problems that we could solve that we sort of saw a route to, to fixing for them. Um, and I had around me at that point, you know, six or seven people that I thought oh, these, this would be an amazing group of people to go and do this thing with. Um, so that was, that was, I think that was the, that was the thing that gave me the confidence to go and quit my job. I quit a job that I loved to go and, and, and do something new. How did that feel though? Um, yeah, how did that feel? It just sounds like quite a scary thing for lots of people to even think about. I think we were so caught up in it. We, we were so caught up in what we were doing. And Red Gate was a very, um, it was a very kind place to do the early experimentation. Uh, so we, we actually got a little bit of time internally to create what was some of the prototypes and do some of the product management. So we had, a, we had a good level of confidence that we weren't, um, we had a good level of confidence that this thing was a good idea. You know, it's, you're still at the very infancy of it. There's still lots of ways that things can fail, but we at least knew this was a, this was, there was something here. Um, and then we were so caught up in the excitement of that, I think. I didn't really, the whole like scariness of quitting your job, I didn't really, think about because I was so focused on on what we were trying to do together. I was so focused on this massive audience of Salesforce administrators and developers that have this problem that I think we can solve and I think we can do in a novel way that's different than what anyone else is doing. And I think we can do it really well. There was just that excitement of doing that, um, that, yeah, I didn't really think much about the downside scariness. I only thought about the opportunity to do something new with a group of people that I really wanted to do that, that thing with. So this group of people, they were, they were, they followed you. That's just amazing to, to, to start a company with a group of people that you've, you've worked with, so, you know, for a while. What did, um, what do your company think about that? that exodus of, of a team of people it was it was all kind of agreed so it was all it was all done you know amicably and um uh, with with the support of of redgate at the time uh the oh, the um let me just turn off my notifications sorry um Yeah, so it was all done amicably with the support of Redgate at the time. Um, in terms of it being a case of them following me, it, it wasn't really. The, from the very start, it was all of us worked together. And that's one of the things that's been an enduring, like an enduring value of Gearset. Even at 130, at 130 people that we are today, you have to have some level of structure. There has to be some level of hierarchy for the thing to work, or at least with me running it. You know, I, I don't know how to run a truly 100% flat uh, 130 person organization but it's pretty close it's pretty close to flat and that's been true from the very very start so i 
we were totally peers um, in terms of decision making, in terms of what we were doing, what we were building, who we were building it for, how we were building it, all of that stuff. We were peers. So it wasn't a case of um, of them following me. It was kind of us following the idea. It was us following this this thing we all wanted to do together. Um, and we've tried to keep that culture as the company's growing. We, I, I, I didn't want any hierarchical stuff. I didn't want the idea that you would end up with um, opinions carrying weight because of their the person that issued them. You know, I, I didn't. I, I just don't like that idea. I like the best idea to win, and and all of that sort of stuff um, resonates a lot more for me. That's the culture I. I thrive it within um, and it's the one that I wanted to create for for all the folks that would join us. Tell me about it sounds like in your career you've had the opportunity to work with different kinds of teams and you've ended up with one that just worked really well. What do you think are some of the components that make so for example you're talking about the you know the your your first job at autonomy and what i've found is that when you have a team of people working towards a an objective and things get really hairy and stressy if you've got the right components everyone just knuckles down and then you form the bond uh, yeah. do you how have you found that moving from team to team and you know at redgate you mentioned that you worked in different divisions learning different things how have you found that? What are the components that make the kind of team that you currently have? Yeah, so I think it's it's different strokes for different folks and, you know, horses for courses and all that sort of stuff. So I think I'm what I'm going to describe is the teams that I like, but I don't for a second presume this to be the one true way to, to build great teams. For me, what are some of the things that I really that really value uh, so it all starts from trust. You sort of read any sort of team management or, or um, any sort of philosophy around that. There has to be strong bonds of trust uh, throughout the team. Um, some of the ways that we do that and cultivate that is I'm very big on the feedback. I'm very, very big on feedback. Um, quite uh, in a way that, that I'll, I'll give you my like idealized outcome, but I don't mean it to sound that if you can't adapt to that. So obviously as, as a manager or as a peer or as anything, you have to be adaptable to the folks around you and flex your style and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but in terms of my sort of idealized outcome, I uh, obviously with my software engineering background, software engineers have a really healthy, at least in good software teams, a really healthy attitude towards code reviews um, around the idea of peer review being just an absolute a uh, fundamental part of your <clears throat> uh, part of your process, and so when an engineer is finished doing a piece of work um, and they're ready to put that through for review, the way I like to think about reviews is um, we put the code, the artifact that I've produced, sort of sits at the other side of the table, and it's now me and a colleague on this side of the table, and we're critiquing it, and we're going to see together if we can tear it apart, put it back together, you know, and we're together we're going to build something better than either of us could have done separately. And so that feedback culture, I think can be applied to almost anything. You're, you're not, when you give me feedback, you're not critiquing me, you're you're critiquing the work. You're trying to make this thing better. And so I, I love that feedback style. That really works for me. And so we've got this really nice culture of feedback where we do that for everything. So everybody at Gearset has opinions on what our marketing team is doing, what our sales team is doing, what our engineering team is doing, what product we're building, how we present ourselves at Dreamforce, how we do anything. Folks can be a part of that conversation um, and give feedback on it. And that's part of who we are. You're not critiquing, um, like we have this awesome graphic designer, Joe. If you give him some feedback on some, you know, uh, you know, LinkedIn ads or something we've put out, you're not critiquing Joe, you're critiquing the LinkedIn ads and Joe welcomes that feedback. He wants it to be the best that it can be. Um, so we, we have that really healthy culture. So the trust, the feedback, and then the thing that I think we do maybe more so than other places I've worked is we have a real culture of transparency. So everybody at the company, we, we, we default to transparent. 
So we default to, if it doesn't need to be confidential internally to the company, then it doesn't need to be confidential. So things that do need to be confidential, any people related issues, anything around folks, what they want to do with their career and progression, all that sort of stuff, we keep that confidential. So, you know, the, the one-to-ones and stuff, all that's confidential, but company strategy, sales performance, marketing performance, product roadmap, all of that stuff is a hundred percent transparent to our staff. And then we try and be as transparent as possible externally as well. So on product roadmap and things, there's just no benefit to keeping this stuff secret. So we have a real nice culture of trust, feedback, and transparency. And those are the types of teams that I like to work in. And, and then also just then, I think on top of that, you can build just teams that are fun. So I like the people that I work with. We go out for dinner, we can go out to the you know, pub and uh, spend time at the weekends. You know, different people at 130. I don't like absolutely everybody that I work with, and I'm sure they don't absolutely like me and like the same movies and things. Um, but a lot of them, a lot of them, we, we do have a lot of sort of shared, uh, shared stuff, and we, we can go out and go out and have fun together. What happens if you make a hire that doesn't quite fit? So, um, let's say somebody who's who takes things personally and it doesn't like your feedback culture. That's a great question. Um, and something we actually, the thing that I've been really conscious of as a skilled gear set is you run the risk of not having enough diversity. You run the risk of not having enough um, folks that are different from you in terms of how they think and in terms of how they approach things. So I've been really conscious that I didn't want to create um, total replicas of the original group of people. Um, and that, that's still something I think, I don't know if we have or not. I, I know it's working really well and we're finding folks and everyone's fitting in. So I don't know for sure if we if we are running that risk. Um, but in, to answer your question directly, we try and avoid that situation, putting ourselves there. Our recruitment process is, I think for candidates, potentially a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, there's, you know, a pretty deep technical uh, stage, depending on if you're engineering or marketing, whatever it is, it's really, really practical. So we don't have you do like any hypothetical stuff. It's, you know, we, if you were interviewing to be an engineer um, on our, one of our teams, we would uh, ask you to um, jump on a session with us. We'd put some code up together with a real problem and we'd work on it together. And we give you Google and we give you Stack Overflow and, you know, whatever, whatever you want, we don't care. Just you know, show us how you would tackle this job for real. Um, and then if you get through that stage, our uh, sort of cultural team fit type interview is again about two hours. And we don't, we try to avoid um, almost any hypothetical stuff. So how would you respond to a situation where instead we dig into, um, uh, you know, what are the best teams you've been a part of? What made it the best team? You know, what actually it's the sort of types of questions you're asking me now would be an excellent uh, team fit uh, interview. So those those are the types of things we do. And we do it to understand how folks, um, how folks like to work, because as I say, I don't presume to say that our way is the correct way. It's just, it is just our way. So if you prefer a different style of environment, then that's great too. You know, you're interviewing us as much as we're interviewing you. So we want to show you through that process who we are. So you can make the right decision for your career. And it's like, I don't want these guys re reviewing my code. You know, I don't want my marketing. I'm my, you know, if you're interviewing a marketer or something like my copy is sacrosanct, you know, you can't copy edit me. Well, then you probably will fit in here. And that, that's okay. You go somewhere where you can, um, you know, you can have that style of culture. And then if you do, if you do join the company, if a, if a recruitment process hasn't, hasn't uh, told each of us uh, what we needed to know, then yeah, it's, it's just understanding when you have that friction, do lots of, lots of one-to-ones, lots of coaching and lots of really open, honest dialogue about, is it something that you're currently uncomfortable with, but you aspire to, to getting there and you want to work on that together? Or is it just fundamentally, you don't like this way of working and 
you, you don't you don't aspire to changing right you're really happy with it, you and it works for you um and then and then we can have just a grown-up conversation about where that takes us have you had a situation where you have a candidate absolutely blow the interview amazing 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 but once they come through they're not quite up to par not not so much actually we, we would take we're a little bit conservative maybe we take the approach we'd rather say no to great candidates than say yes to the wrong one um the team that we've built i'm, I'm immensely proud of and I, I love working with every day and i think that's true for all my colleagues so we we don't we we don't take a lot of risk in that department we take risks elsewhere in the business but not in hiring hiring we get the right folks so the number of people that have left gear set either because I've unfortunately had to ask them to leave or because they've you know wanted to leave themselves um, is really small really 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 small we've we've very small amounts of turnover um, uh, so I don't know I think I think what we're doing is working for us anyway okay so you mentioned about risk there you say you don't take risks when it comes to hiring people where do you take risks um, maybe progressing people so you know if you take me as an example um i'm an i'm a pretty pretty okay software engineer um but when we left redgate to start gear set there were so many other things that i wasn't good at and i sort of look back on in hindsight as like you know if, if i had known the things that i didn't know would i have done it sort of thing um so we take risks on people internally like folks where um, we give them opportunity to do things that are outside their comfort zone. Um, I, I like doing that. We'll take risks on trying new things and not being afraid to make ourselves uncomfortable either. I, I don't know. I did, but in marketing sales, new ways of working, um, opening offices globally, you know, we're, we're ambitious about what we're doing. Um, it's just that hiring one. I, don't, I don't want to, because the consequences of that mistake are um, bad for you because you disrupt your team. And it's really bad for that person because that's a knock on their career journey or that's a knock to their competence, if, especially if you have to be the one that asks them to leave. Um, that's a really unpleasant conversation. And it's a, it's, it, can it, can, it can have an impact on them. So around hiring, I, we don't want to have to bring someone in if we think there's any risk that we might be asking them to leave. You mentioned about opening offices globally. Um, how many do you have at the moment? It's just the two. So we have our headquarters in Cambridge. Um, actually, I guess two and a half. We have our headquarters in Cambridge. Uh, we hired a bunch of folks uh, over the last 18 months that are based in London. So we will probably do a, a London office if they want to work that way. And then the the second one that we opened that we're going to create like a center at and really scale is uh, our office in Chicago, um, which would be a sales marketing support uh, office. Would you be overseeing the recruitment there or how would uh, you? We've hired a super leader in that office, um, a guy called Simon Bishop. And he's, you know, one of the reasons um, we, we hired him was he's all aligned on values. Uh, so he thinks about building teams in the same way that he, he wanted to be part of the team that we have built and the culture that we've built that resonated with him. So I'm really confident that he's going to create not, not the cookie cutter, same culture, but um, the same values and the same principles in, in that office. I've, I have been a part of the early recruitment into that office just because I, I like meeting folks. I, I quite, I quite like the recruitment side of things. Um, and the first four or five people that we've hired are, uh, they're super. Um, so I, I've, I've loved going through recruitment with them. I've loved the first few months of working with them and I'm really excited. I'm, I'm hopeful we get out to, to visit them now in Q4 and get myself across to Chicago and get to meet them in person and go out for, for some dinner. Sounds good. Um, how has the pandemic, um, affected the people in your company and your business? It's been it's been really variable across the the team. Um, so from a business sort of continuity point of view, it, it's it's been there, there's been no real impact. We we were a pretty flexible organization before we 
um, folks could work from home as and when they pleased. We have a nice office in Cambridge that um, people would go to because it was a nice place to hang out with people you like hanging out with and a nice environment to work in. But you didn't need to be there. We never enforced it and we didn't monitor it or anything. Um, so we were able to switch to full time working from home really effectively. Um, we tried our best to do uh, as much the sort of team cohesion stuff. So we did we did what everyone else did, and we moved to like virtual events and um, like uh, escape room stuff where you're like on Zoom shouting instructions at the person that's having to run around and do burpees because you're telling them to do burpees or whatever it is. So we do all that sort of stuff. Um, we we tried as much as possible to create social things um, because that was one of the things that was going to be most hard to recreate. Uh, folks have a lot of choice in where they can work, right? They can work wherever. Uh, so one of the things that I think a lot of people work at Gearset because of is because of the people they work with. So if you we want to keep that attachment as much as possible because that's what makes it all fun. Um, and then on the personal level for like different people, so the, so the human level, um, folks were impacted the way everyone sort of globally was impacted. You know, people lost family members, people suffered with isolation or had kids running around where they were doing homeschooling. They, you know, they had um, gear sets of, I say at this stage now, over a hundred people. So in a group of a hundred people, you're going to have people who enjoyed it more, enjoyed it less, were reasonably unaffected. I was thankfully really unaffected by it all. Um, and some folks that, that were affected by it, you have, you have a spectrum and then just try and support them as, as best we can. It's hit, as you say, different people differently. Um, I'm going to pivot slightly to um, software development because sure. um, methodologies in particular, because that's something that I it, it interests me a lot. How what how do you develop software within your company? It goes back to a lot of that feedback stuff. So if we sort of separate our product and engineering, not that they're separate, but if we tackle them separately for a second. Um, on the product side, uh, I'm a big believer in getting stuff out to users as quickly as possible. So validate your assumptions that you're baking in. So when you have the idea, before you have the idea or the very conception of the idea, start talking to users about it. And then if you think, oh, we should um, do something new in this area. Okay, we'll talk to them at the very, very start before you've written any code. Uh, once you've once you have validated the idea and you think yes we should go and invest in, in this area then slice it up into the smallest possible useful deliverable which if you're doing like lean startup -y style stuff you know people refer to minimum viable product and all that kind of thing and you can get lost in all the uh, terminology and all the, the the sort of like the one true wayism stuff um but i think i think the principle is great which is how what's the what's the most what's the most useful thing that i can do that i can get in front of users as quickly as possible because then they can tell me for real if it's useful um so there's this book i love called the mom test uh, if you join gear set we sent it to everybody i get everybody to read this book because it was such an impact on me um but it's this idea that how do you pitch an idea that even your mom would be able to say to you the truth of it so you know in theory again not everyone's so lucky but in theory your parents are very very supportive of what you do so if you say hey mom i'm thinking of doing this idea do you think it's a good idea they'll say yes you should go and do that thing um this is less true for irish parents by the way but the, again the, the the principle i think is a, a pretty solid one um so we want to get it out in front of users as as quickly as possible because uh we that 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 then is the truth of it right is do they actually use it does it actually fix their problem and then iterate 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 so we do that for product and we do that then our engineering philosophy is all around that so we do very quick iterations we deploy gear set itself to all of our users uh, globally across all of our data centers three or four times a day each and every day um we try and go from first line of code written until it's in production in sort of 36 hours. Obviously varies depending on what's happening, but that's, that's what we're trying to do. We want to 
What is the smallest, safest iteration that you can do to get us from where we are to just another step along the path of where we want to be? So take the agile stuff and and really, really like, um, again, none of the dogma, but all of the philosophy, I guess. Mm. So we don't have any, we don't follow Scrum strictly or Kanban strictly or any of these things strictly. We uh, adopt what works for us, um, which is around identify the smallest next possible iteration that we can get to and deliver that and get feedback and get feedback and get feedback. Um, so I, obviously I come from, you know, discrete projects, taking company from state A to state B. State A might be, I have Siebel, state B, I now have Salesforce. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's a structured series of steps that get you there from requirements gathering, analyzing your current environment, blah, 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 writing up the requirements, building it, testing it, deploying it. So it's fairly structured and I know yeah. It's quite different when you're a software company and you're building and continuously improving on product that you have. Um, so, you know, um, with that in mind, how do you do your testing? So it's all, so uh, my head, there's two things. One is you are improving, you are iterating, you are adding to your functionality set. At the same time, Salesforce is releasing three times a year and so on and so forth. So you got, like these two things you've got to keep in sync. How do you do that? And how do you test to make sure that the product that you are putting out there is worth for everyone in their environment, in the various flavors? Yeah, you, you, it's a massive challenge. So you got to take a, a multi-dimensional approach to, to tackling it. You sort of need to use every tool in your arsenal. Um, so we've got all the classic things like a decent uh, unit test coverage. You know that that's uh, as an engineering philosophy is baked in. We don't we don't do strict TDD. We don't force you to write the test up front. But when your code gets submitted for peer review, we want both the code and the tests. We don't really care what order you wrote them in. We think TDD is a perfectly sensible way to do this. If you disagree, that's great. As long as thirty six hours later, when you're ready to do your code review, we want both those things. So that, that helps us get a pretty good unit test coverage. Uh, we also have integration tests then, both at sort of functional level and then also sort of UI based, like right prior to release, do the red routes still work through our, uh, through our product. So we automate all that sort of stuff. We then practice a pretty decent DevOps philosophy ourselves. So we try and put as much ownership and responsibility onto the feature for our feature onto the developer as we can. Uh, so they will be responsible for writing the code um, and also making sure that before it goes to production, it works. Um, so again, you put a certain amount of onus on, you know, it better not be obviously broken. <laughs> There's always going to be edge cases and stuff once it like reaches the, the, the you know, the, the, the tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of orgs that we're working with. Um, but, you know, it better work for most of them, better work for at least the ones you've accessed it. Um, our own orgs and things. So we put that responsibility on the users or onto our uh, internal developers. And then going back to the iteration and feedback cycle thing, one of the things that I really like about that is, I'm sure you've seen this. If you, um, if you have to review uh, a massive essay, you know, tens or hundreds of pages, right? Or if you have to review in software, like tens of thousands of lines of code have changed. There is only so much review you can do on that. So if you've been working for weeks and weeks and weeks on a feature before it gets to peer review, there's only so much scrutiny that can go into it. Uh, either from yourself, first and foremost, where you review it first, there's only so much you can do when it's that massive daunting task. Whereas if you've broken it down to be small, 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 then first of all, you can do a great review. So you're more likely to spot any issues in either the design or the implementation. Um, and then certainly your, your colleague will be able to as well. It's easier to ask questions about a few hundred lines of code than it is a few tens of thousands of lines of code. So you, you take a whole bunch of different approaches through uh, personal responsibility on the feature, um, lots of automation to catch us. Um, and then by doing small things, it's easier to spot the issue. And once we put it into production, 
we've got a really nice um, uh, uh, deployment uh, system that just rolls it out a little bit by little bit. We'll test it out with some users and then all the users, and then eventually it'll go to, go to everyone. Um, and along the way, there's nice monitoring that will say, oh, our, our error rate is spiking here. Okay, then let's pull back. And that's on the stuff that we're changing that we control on stuff that Salesforce is changing under our feet or GitHub are changing under our feet or, or whatever. Um, that just comes out of monitor. Well, as much as possible, we work with our partners to make sure that we know what their release cycles look like and what's happening and what's changing and access to preview orgs and nightly patch releases and things uh, so we can run our automated test suites against it. Um, but ultimately, yeah, some things still just change in unexpected ways. And then we have good monitoring telemetry and um, an amazing engineering team that can that can respond quickly. Okay, sounds like you got quite a good um, framework to work with. Um, having lean, leaning on your previous experience in development. Um, yeah, so I'm quite interested to hear a bit more about your transition between you now from software developer to a co-founder, what were the things that surprised you about this change in role? That's a great question. Um, what's surprising? It sounds a little bit naive, but the, the, the move to Every, everything's about people. Everything's about getting, you're no longer doing the work. It's you're getting other folks to do the work and getting them all aligned to do the right work. Um, being responsible for that alignment um, is probably the, probably one of the sort of biggest uh, things that I've experienced over the last few years. Uh, that probably sounds hopelessly naive to anyone that's done anything of this scale before. Um, that how, how is that surprising to you? How could you not have realized that was coming? Um, but you know, when you're originally when it was the seven and then that doubles the 14, you still sort of know everybody. And then it doubles the 28, you still, you still sort of know everybody. And then, you know, when you get up to over a hundred, you, you can't know anybody, everybody anymore. And, and critically, they can't know you. So they're always trying to think, oh, what would you do in this situation? Or, you know, what, what do they think the company wants you to do? Um, but if you haven't communicated that effectively, uh, because they don't have the history of knowing you for you know ten years, um, then then things can go wrong. Uh, so that that creating clarity, create over communicating um, the values, all that sort of stuff has been a really interesting learning over the last uh, the last couple of years. And then <clears throat> probably the sort of personal impact stuff. I don't get to write software anymore at all. Like I just. There's no way it's a good use of the CEO's time to, to write code. Uh, so if the company, if I'm on the company's time, um, I don't write any code anymore at all. Um, I, I'm all around our go to market, working with our sales team, working with our sales leaders, working with the marketing teams, our customer success organization, uh, working with our most strategic customers to understand what they're looking for. Um, all, all of that sort of stuff is, has been a, a massive shift for me over the last number of years. And then the only time I get to write code now is I do it at the weekend as, uh, as much of a loser as that might make me sound like, uh, because I, uh, I find it very relaxing. So I'll, I'll, I'll write some code on the weekend just to remind myself, this is a thing that I'm, I'm okay at. How do you feel about shifting in the transition? Um, you know, what comes to mind is a, a Dilbert strip around how he's moved from engineering to managing people. Do you miss, do you miss um, the things that you used to do or are you enjoying your, your new identity as uh, someone who runs the company? I, I, I really love my job. Um, I do miss some of the engineering stuff, but I, I, I choose my job, right? I'm lucky enough to be able to choose the things I want to do in life and I wouldn't switch what I'm doing. Um, I get to work with an amazing group of people um, across the entire company. I get an amazing, there's very few people at a company the size of Gearsets that 
understand it end to end that that's very hard to recreate um so every single aspect of gear set and how customers interact with it how new users interact with it how folks respond to our marketing you know you very rarely are in a position that in any given week or even in any given day where you're going to be having conversations about all of those things um whereas i get to do that and i feel very lucky getting to do it um it's a really it's a really nice job to work with me people that are amazing at the thing they're responsible for. So our, our marketing team, I work with our marketing leader a lot, Alice, and she's amazing at her job and the team that she's assembled around her is, they're, they're doing fantastic work. And I get to sort of be a part of that. I get to watch these people that are infinitely better at this thing than I would ever be if I ever put my mind to it. They are world-class. Um, and I get to see how world-class people do this thing and the same within our engineering organization, our customer success, sales, our internal ops, you know, I get to work with all these incredible people and get to see, oh, that's, so if you're working with a truly world-class uh, chief people officer and that that's what that's what that person does, oh, that's, that's really interesting. I, I really like that. So I, I don't, I do miss engineering, but I'm very happy with the things that I do day to day. Super cool. So if you had a, time machine and I could take you back six years what would you tell yourself just as you were thinking about doing this like if you did this it would save you lots of pain so what are three things you would tell yourself when you when you just started your journey at Gearset that that would have saved you mountains of pain um. Be, be more confident, have a, a little bit less imposter syndrome. So uh, nobody knows what they're doing. Just just crack on and, and get it done. Uh, prob probably a little, a little bit of that, you know, hire faster. You know, the first the first hire we made, the uh, once we were, once we had set it all up, we waited, we waited probably a little bit too long for that. Um, we thought we had this, this perfect thing at seven, right? If we added an eighth person, then Oh, that'll be somebody new and I don't know them and I want to work with them. And the person that we ended up doing and hiring was uh, this guy, Frank Short, uh, who's still with Gearset. He's uh, an enterprise account executive with us. And he is, um, the day we hired him is one of the best days. He's He's been an amazing, an amazing colleague. Um, I wish we'd have done that earlier. I wish I had the confidence to do that earlier. And uh, probably, other thing I would have done is um, stop writing code sooner, maybe switch to get your head stuck into the sales and marketing. That's a lot of fun and you'll enjoy it a lot more than you expect. I'd never done any sales uh, prior to prior to starting year set. Um, and it's a lot of fun. That's been a really fun thing to do to run a to build and run a sales organization over the, the last few years. And the way gear set those sales because there's obviously a bunch of different approaches to this you can kind of do lots of bums on seats and just send them forth and hire and fire if they don't make quota and all the rest um whereas gear set sales organization is again a fantastic group of people who you could grab any of our account executives and have a really in-depth conversation about uh, Salesforce DevOps, what folks are trying to do, how to structure great teams. Like again, that the stuff that I was talking about earlier about how to structure an engineering organization, you know, we have account executives that can have that conversation with you. They have now done that consultative stuff so much with uh, different customers around the world that these guys are, are world-class experts that can get up on stage at Dreamforce and, and other events and talk knowledgeably about this stuff, not from a script, um, but because they know it, they know it inside out. Um, so yeah, that's the thing. The other thing I tell myself is get stuck into sales and marketing a little bit earlier. Um, you'll, you'll surprise yourself and find it a really, really enjoyable, creative, intellectual pursuit. So just going back to your first one, you, you, you talked about imposter syndrome. Has that, has that feeling impacted the things and the actions that you took? Or was it just an internal angst about 
where you where you were heading? Um, it's hard to know for sure because I did the things that I did. Um, so it's hard to know if it impacted me or if I didn't have those doubts that everyone has. If you would to take a take a different action, um, I think I don't know I, I, in your career if you if you've had this as well. But I think it's pretty common in any group of really high performing individuals that this is uh, if if you're in any way if you have a modicum of self awareness that you're um, that that you do occasionally doubt yourself, especially when you're working with incredibly high performing people is it uh, am i worthy enough of am i good enough to be next to the people i'm working with and I've, I've been really lucky that i've worked with exceptionally talented people um so i you occasionally occasionally doubt yourself uh so i think it's more internal angsty stuff and then it's a little bit i, I don't know with me at least it's a little bit par for the course so i've got okay coping strategies to to just if I find that voice of doubt in my head, it's like, no, no, I, I know what this voice is and I'm going to just quiet that down and I'm going to keep going because we've got this. We know what we're doing. We're good at this. You know, the seven people you were talking about in this team, were they all engineers or were they different skill sets or? They were different, skill, they were different skill sets. So even, um, uh, I guess you would call them, a, it was a product team. So they were, they were all product, um, but variety of skills. So again, our engineers are pretty versatile. So I think a lot of engineering teams that I've worked on in the past would be a little bit nervous about speaking to customers or getting on stage at a conference and demoing what they've done. Or, you know, the, the first year we went to Dreamforce where it was just the seven of us on the booth and, you know, you got to stop people walking past and go, Hey, how's it going? How's your dream first? And have a little conversation like that. Most, a lot of developers that I've worked with, um, would be a little bit uncomfortable doing that. Whereas my colleagues at that time, we were all, uh, not, not, a, not ecstatic about doing that thing, but we, we could get ourselves there. You know, we could, we could teach ourselves to do it. Uh, so those engineers, it sort of does a little bit of disservice to, 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 to only label them as engineers. They're just, they're talented folks that could do whatever they wanted. They were just very good at engineering too. And then we mixed in, um, in the original seven, uh, we had uh, Stephen Chambers, who is this incredible uh, UX designer. And again, that almost minimizes his scope because it's, uh, he's incredible at sales, fantastic at marketing. Um, this, this guy can sort of do whatever he wants. It's just, it just happens to be his superpower is being able to, do the product management and and understand the real job to be done, like what our customers really trying to do, and then build a product to to solve it. And we had uh, Jason, who uh, is now our head of customer success, um, and at that time was I can't remember what job title we had at the very start for him, but it was like he was our uh, like get stuff done guy. He could do marketing, he could do sales, he could do just whatever had to happen. He he could make it happen. Um, that was that was Jason. Uh, so we we had a we had a mix of folks within that, but I would say they were all product folks. Amazing, amazing. I, w I want to be very respectful of your time because uh, we're coming up to the end. So uh, I just wanted to thank you once again for uh, making the time to come and talk to me. It's been really, really fascinating to not only hear about how you've got to where you are today, but especially for me personally. Um, all your uh, insights about creating teams, about hiring the right talent. And I like how, you know, towards the end, you, you gave shout out to the folks who have um, made such an impact to, to where you are today. So thank you very much, Kevin. I really, really appreciate your time today. I really appreciate the conversation. So uh, yeah, thank you very much.